Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, sorry, one one last one, Denise. Um, and then if you, you know, we had a great time. We checked out the Kahalu'u shaft with you guys and got to see kind of that system. So thank you for allowing us to come and to visit. Um, can, can you just talk a little more about that? I, I'm trying to recall from our, we've been meeting on several occasions and um, there were several basal lenses that had relatively high levels of chlorides yeah. and Kahalu'u shaft was one. Um, so what are you guys doing right now? You're mixing that water with high level water Correct. to achieve a better chloride level before it's delivered, is that? Right. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh, thank you, and thank you for your presentation. Look forward to learning more. Um, some questions that um, relate to some of the earlier questions. So the first one is regarding that county only, county linked, and then if I can just say purely private, nothing. But do you have a sense of, in the aquifer, what percentage of current pumpage, even if it's snapshot, kind of falls in those categories that you were talking about? The, am I asking a question that makes sense in your I world? I think so. Yeah. yeah. Um, and actually, we'd probably have to defer to, to um, Seaworm staff for that. But our understanding is we know what we pump from our sources. We report that. And that one is about 11, 11 and a half million gallons a day, I think, for the last 12 month uh, annual average. Um, and then our understanding is total pumping from the aquifer is about 14, 15, Roy. So, you know, so if we got 11 and a half out of 14 or 11 and a half out of 15, then we're assuming that difference is, you know, other sources. And then that difference, you were talking before about if it's linked to the county infrastructure, it comes mm -hmm. under your purview. Mm -hmm. So help me out a little bit more that difference, which is, what is that, three or four MGD? Yeah. Is kind of how much of that then is linked and comes within your review. I guess what we're trying to figure out in these questions is right. how much, what is your kuleana really? And, right. and I know it's as complex. Far as direct purview, I would say just the 11 and a half at this point in time. But if some of that was a part of, let's say, Hualalai's wells that fall within the aquifer, um, if it was tied to a subdivision application like Milton alluded to previously, then we had a hand in the initial review. Um, but as far as the day-to-day -day managing and operating after that, then, then our involvement is minimal to none. Okay, thank you. And then um, regarding the development, water use development plan process that you were describing in terms of the scope of work and consulting of the commission, all that, what is the uh, consultation and public participation process with stakeholders other than the commission process we were just talking about? In other words, and specifically, where would the park fa fall among the range of conversations that you either required to have or could have as you move forward? And what was the target date at summer of 2015 right. in the I, next, what is that, eight months? I, I think maybe commission, uh, your staff might have a little bit better insight, but our understanding through our last process was that it did require public involvement. There was a series of public hearings prior to final adoption of the Water Use and Development Plan. Um, so those, those are the opportunities. And I think it also goes to council for adoption. And through those proceedings, the public can weigh in. And then ultimately, I believe this body uh, adopts that study. And I guess there's those proceedings as well. So there, there's uh, several opportunities is my understanding. So do you, okay, so maybe this is better asked to another audience then. Um, I'm just wondering about whether or not specifically if if the park, ha park has, would have real traction, if the National Park Service would have real traction as you move forward in that process, not to privilege them, but just to say, because um, I think the comments made earlier that they made, that they've, at least they expressed the comments that they've commented many, many times, and I got this strong sense from them, they feel like they haven't been truly participating and heard whatever or had traction in the process. And I hear you saying, well, we have a public process, but where does the park fall in that? They would be invited. Mm -hmm. they would, and we could actually proactively invite them to participate in the process. Okay, so that's great. And then um, the, um, the other question I want to ask, the same question I asked the National Park Service, and, and uh, Mr. Kudo, you might have an answer to this, is do you feel like you need more time to provide either 
arguments on the factual issues or the legal issues or, I mean, you, you never say never, but do you need more time to submit any information or is what's submitted today kind of what we need to know about your positions and your comments on the preliminary findings of fact? We, we would only need uh, extra time for the uh, report that uh, they're working on right now, the uh, summer of this next year. Okay. To submit. So um, no need extra time on the no. findings of fact. You yeah. kind of put up everything you needed. I, I, I was kind of puzzled by the uh, comment by the National Park Service with regard to legal issues in relationship to this water designation um, uh, uh, forum because uh, I would think that they would if they wanted legal issues interpreted by this commission, they would they would seek a declaratory order mm -hmm. rather than ask for you to give them an interpretation of a statute rule or regulation that may be applicable to the circumstances before you. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't seem like it would, this would be the appropriate forum for that, but mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Well, let me ask a further question on that. Do you feel like you need the opportunity to present any further legal argument at this point uh, where we are in the process? If we do, we would file a <laughs> petition for declaratory order. Okay. So, okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. And also, um, are there any new potable wells planned for Keho in the basal lens area? Do you know? Who are we looking for? <laughs> yeah, not, not, not that has it's been not, presented not that you to know us. Of. So they're all, all the new future wells that are, are in the high level. So it's kind of all the, all the developments migrating up to the high level. If, I think if they want to use it as a portable water source for human consumption. Okay. Um, other people can't hear you. I could hear you, but okay. For it, as far as you know, so I, again, our mission is potable water. Right. For, um, I'm talking about potable. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. As far as we know, then that's the that's where you would probably drill a source okay. up in the high level. Thank you. Before I go to you, can I ask a follow-up question on that? And that is, it sounds like your policy is to get everyone to go up into the higher elevation water. What what mechanism? Do that within your process? Um, I guess it's through that collaborative process. If, if they want to utilize our system to get it to their point of distribution, um, then it has to work hydraulically within our system, and that means typically putting it up there, Malka. Um, that's where all our long-term CIP, CIP plans are, is to bring Malka water down. So, um, and from what we've seen, um, you know, we. We just anticipate that you would have some chloride challenges if you were to, to try to develop a source in the basal at this point. So um, that's just an informal policy at this point. If somebody came and said, hey, we have proven source in the basal area that is artesian or whatever, and the chlorides are like single digits, we take a look at that also. Um, we'd, of course, talk story with Roy guys and, and see if this is for real or not. Um, and not just say, oh, great, you know, let's, let's, let's do it. Um, so there's a lot of collaboration. It's not just um, done in a vacuum, not definitely not just done by us. Um, but right now, the rule of thumb, then yeah, it's up there. Okay, and then what would be, um, what would be a, 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 sort of a conservative policy along those lines as to is there a, is there a distance between wells along that Malka mm -hmm. corridor Yes. that you folks have in mind yes. so that you know the wells don't start interfering with each other exactly correct yeah, and and that too is done in collaboration with roy guys too um again rule of thumb is maybe a quarter mile um but all you know what happens is we do have results you know we do have wells that are within a certain proximity of each other um so for example a well up in kyopu i know there's a, a series of wells up there when they do their pump tests I think typical staff recommendation is monitor an adjacent well to see if there is an impact during the pump test of this particular well if we're seeing subsequent drawdown in this adjacent wells. And that'll help them figure out, oh, you know, we're too close or we're safe, um, things like that. Okay, thank you. Jonathan? I'm sorry. We heard from NPS that they're concerned about uh, uh, well, new basal wells uh, uh, in areas adjacent 
to the park. Uh, I would assume that uh, since he said no new basal uh, potable wells are coming online, I would assume that they're talking about golf and irrigation and ag wells. Um, do you know how much, uh, how, what the total of those new uh, uh, golf and uh, irrigation and ag wells is? Yeah, sorry, I don't. Yeah. Okay. Um, how much of uh, the water that, uh, the basal water that you're currently pumping in the area uh, has, uh, has fairly high uh, uh, chlorides, more than uh, you would feel comfortable providing directly to customers? How many sources? Uh, yeah, but how, how much, how many uh, million gallons per day? I guess every, every source that um, are in any triple digits, you know, 150, I guess, has been mentioned as a benchmark, but um, <laughs> yeah, if it was up to our uh, desire, it would be to minimize all the use of the basal sources just because pretty much almost all of them have that challenge. Um, okay, how, how much is that? Hmm, I don't have that number for you. The split between how much we're pumping basal versus how much we're pumping from high level. Yeah, so how much basal water are you pumping that needs to be replaced? I guess about half. So that's about five and a half to six million gallons a day. Yeah. And what is your plan uh, to uh, replace uh, those basal wells? Well, we actually do have uh, six high level sources. Um, that are not maxed out. So our, our larger challenge is the other pieces of infrastructure, which is our transmission and, and to take that water and bring it down the hill. So we have a Waiaha well that we could probably uh, utilize more than what we're currently using it because of those constraints. Um, and some, at somewhere down the line, uh, we're also looking at a, a Keoho well that we have partnered with the Kamehameha Schools um, and, and putting that online as well somewhere in the future. So, I mean, what I, what I, what I seem to be hearing is that you're, you're not uh, adding the high-level source, but the private developers are in all cases. Um, is that, is that uh, pretty much true? Mm, yeah, I wouldn't say that. So again, the Kamehameha School Well is one that we're working on. Um, so they've drilled it in the past. Uh, we've mm -hmm. partnered with them to to wrap it up if we if what we call outfitting it turning it into production which is you know just more than a case hole you require electrical controls you need the tank you need transmission lines uh, and, and things like that um, and other than that we I think we have in the future in our proposed CIP one more additional well we haven't determined exact location yet um, so that's maybe someday correct um, what is your mechanism, uh, since you're not the one who's developing the new source, uh, to get the uh, private developers to uh, give you a source? A mechanism? Yeah. Uh, or, or the incentive? Or, well, the mechanism is um, our, what we call a water developer agreement. Uh, basically, if, like, you know, Mr. Kudo had, had briefly explained, is that most developers don't want to operate and maintain a standalone water system. So typically they'll utilize our current infrastructure. They'll drill a, a well up at the top. Um, then we'll enter into some kind of discussions with them. And okay, if they drill it uh, at certain capacity, you know, you guys get so much water, we need some water to, to provide to the customer base in our system. Uh, other requirements would be, hey, who does what? You know, if you guys only need a half mil for your subdivision, uh, but ideally we could use a million over there, we'll partner with them on that as well, share costs on that upsizing. Um, it's, it's through some form of uh, agreement that is executed through our water board. So you're dependent on the private develop the great good graces of the private developers to try to make good the water you have from the wells that have all gone salty. I wouldn't say dependent. 
I say we work together and collaborate so we can both benefit from this collaboration. <clears throat> um, now, if I say I owned a big piece of property up uh, Malka somewhere that was suitable for uh, water development, and I wanted to uh, put in a well, and I, I was doing a project that required a million gallons a day of, um, of new source. So how big a well would I have to uh, uh, provide? What would be the pump, cap the com pump capacity uh, that I would have to provide if I wanted to utilize a million gallons a day uh, uh, for my own project? Uh, probably at least 1,000 GPM. Okay, so that's um, about uh, uh, I I'm tr I'm trying to I'm trying to understand this because I always learned that uh, if you take the pump capacity of a well, the water you actually use would be uh, two-thirds of two-thirds of that pump capacity mm -hmm. because you derate it by one-third for uh, 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 demand factors in peak day, average day, because there are some days when you're going to be needing to pump a lot more. And then you also have uh, to derate it by another third for uh, um, system factors, which means that on any given day, a certain percentage of the wells will, will be out of service and so on, so you, you have to. So I had always understood that if I needed uh, um, a million gallons a day, I, I would actually have to uh, uh, provide slightly in, in excess of two million gallons a day in uh, pump capacity uh, to ensure that there's always one million gallon a day uh, available. So I'm trying to understand where the uh, the county's uh, take comes from to replace uh, to go back into the system that is needs to be uh, made whole. Mm. Yeah, so our, our most recent agreements have been more on the two thirds, one third. However, we don't compound that with another two thirds, one third. So, so again, if you needed a million gallons a day, then typically 1,000, 1,050 GPM would be a rated capacity, 24 hours pumping of a million and a half, and, and that would satisfy typically uh, our requirements. So they would put a, a rated well at a million and a half, they would get a million, and you would use the excess if there really was excess, because you're banking that there isn't, you know, system or demand factors. Uh, correct. So you're using the phantom water. I'm not sure if that was a, yeah. yeah um, we don't use that term. Okay. Um, I, 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 yeah, go ahead. I'll come back. Take, take a breath, bro. You're getting lots of questions. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> appreciate, um, appreciate you just talking story with us. Um, just, uh, I, I think maybe two, two more questions um, for me. You know, when I look at that graph, the authorized plan use, 6,000 above um, what the sustainable yield is. No, 600. 600% above. Yeah, sorry. I'm getting my zeros mixed up. And I'm not even answering the questions. You're answering all the questions. Um, so what, what do you, what's the, your guys' process for mitigating that? Or is it, I mean, is it sufficient to say, look, it's just not going to happen in any measurable time, so we're not worried about it? Yeah, no, I, yeah, uh, that's a good question. I, I wouldn't say we're not worried about it. Um, I, think, I think what we tried to explain previously is that, I guess in my mind, um, the LUPEG is more of a concept, a conceptual vision of, of you know, proposed where things are going to go, not specific to how much is going to go where and when. 
So I think that exercise that was performed back in the 2010 Water Use and Development Plan was, you know, we're engineers, right? So we kind of need a picture or we need some figures or we need a drawing. Um, so to me, that was more like uh, putting a quantified amount onto a qualitative concept, basically. Um, it's to just say, hey, if every square inch was developed in this theoretical world that uses some guesstimate of water, you know, so many units per um, so many square feet, which is who knows, right? Um, and, and take a look, if, if everything was evaluated with that same assessment, island-wide, which is what that first water use and development plan update back in 2010 was trying to do, is just use a common uh, baseline for the whole island. Then we can see hey, where we might have to look at closer. So even with that totally unrealistic scenario, because nobody's gonna develop 100% every square inch of property. You know, that's, even if you look at downtown Honolulu, it doesn't have that type of development or that type of density. So we never intended that to be a projection of future water needs. It was an exercise to say, hey, where can we just say, you know what, this side, and typically Puna, Hilo, Hamakua, hey, no problem, get enough sustainable yield. If every square inch was developed to its max potential, even with that unrealistic scenario, still get enough water, as amazing as that is. Um, but now we got two aquifer systems where using that assessment, using that concept, and just putting a number so that we could get that determination, basically to have a number so we could make that call, which aquifer system we gotta look at closer. It was never to say, that's what the future water needs were ever going to be. It was just to say, we gotta look closer at these two places. And, th and that was the intent of that exercise. So um, I wouldn't say it's uh, something that we totally disregard, um, but we totally don't expect that to ever happen. Um, and just to be honest, we, you know, whatever land use policies we have in place, uh, we wouldn't come close to that anyway, as far as traffic or other infrastructure requirements. Um, but I don't want to say, you know, it's um, you know, it's something that helped us determine where we should go from there. Yeah. If I could add to that, <clears throat> um, Sorry. Chapter Two Hundred Five, Act One Hundred, created the land use commission process where they uh, basically planned out the entire state in four categories, agriculture, urban, conservation, uh, rural. And the Lupag map, is, Lupag map is similar to that. Most of our state is in the agricultural district. It doesn't mean that those lands are gonna be used for agricultural purposes. It means just for planning purposes, that's what they think should be there at some point in the future. It's not tied to a specific developer or landowner or anything like that. And having been the person that has to take projects through the, the land use entitlement process, just because your property has the right color on the loop bag map doesn't mean that you're gonna get the zoning or anything else approved. It is just a merely a planning tool that the county uses to look ahead in the future. In other words, so what, what what Keith is really saying is that that planning tool was meant for a different purpose than calculating water usage. It really wasn't meant to calculate water usage. Mm -hmm. and, 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 I, and, and if you try to put the two together, you come up with an absurd result. A million people in the Keoho region at some point in the future. When is that ever gonna happen? Mm -hmm. um, so I think we have to put that in a context of what the purpose of that planning tool is all about. And I'm sure that the water code, when it was adopted by the legislature, in fact, it's in the committee reports, was not intended to uh, hinder or impede the counties from their planning and zoning capabilities and functions and obligations. And so, because if you do, and this is used as a water regulating mechanism, that all the counties in their loop bog maps would put something like unplanned or open space, because they don't want to be tied to uh, the water commission dictating what can or can't happen in those lands that they want to be able to plan for. So it wasn't used for that specific purpose. That is, the loop map was not designed to project forward water usage of, uh, for the county of Hawaii mm. in, in, in any way. Mm. 
Thank you. One, one more question. Sure. You, you mentioned urban Honolulu and, you know, almost all of Oahu is a designated area. Only Waianae is not. Plenty of development. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking you guys must talk with the Board of Water on Oahu. And um, so what, I mean, really, what's, what's the fear? What's the, why are you guys so adamantly opposed um, in, this, in this process? See, our fear, and, um, you know, I hope I'm not getting in, you know, into somebody else's business, but, you know, our understanding, and we're all different counties, our systems are all different. Um, our under my understanding of how it worked on Maui and Oahu um, was that there was opportunity for them to utilize sources more and, and, and pump at, at increased rates um, because their systems are interconnected. So in other words, they had like a buffer to play with because they could move water around. Um, so in other words, say if you had an aquifer like Iao, um, and I'm not saying this is what was done, but you know, if they have adjacent aquifers nearby each other, you could theoretically, during this 12-month um, period of time, you know, just kind of bump up your pumping, so you're establishing your 12-month baseline. Um, so when designation actually happens, hey, you kind of created this buffer for yourself. Um, we don't intend to do that, nor do we have the capability to do that. We're trying to be up and up. We're trying to be straightforward, as we've always been with commission staff. Um, and this is what we got. This is what we're doing. We're not going to try and, and, and try to pull anything over anybody by kind of trying to create this um, bogus pumping number, if, if I could say that. Um, so all we got is what we got. We don't have that capability of trying to pump this aquifer and sending it south, you know, to just increase our 12-month uh, annual average at this point. Um, all we got is what we got. Now, if we do go along and get designated and we have to file permits, um, existing use permits, from what we understand, it's going to be based on those, those average pumping that we've had over the, in the recent past. Um, that doesn't include these other water commitments or even that doesn't account for, you know, we have enough laterals in the ground. I think, um, you know, equates to almost one MGD of laterals that just never had a meter put in, but all it takes is somebody to come into our office and say, hey, I finally want my meter. I'm gonna build a house now. And there's, you know, if we just added all those up, there'd be another million gallons a day. And those wouldn't have been factored into that 12 month pumping that we would have to report under our existing water use permit. Um, so that's, that's our fear, is that our existing permit is that. And we, that's all we got. Commissioner Beaver, if I may, also just from a regulatory standpoint, the overlay regulation that is afforded this commission through the water management area, um, what the major difference is this. Right now, the county of water, uh, county, of, county of Hawaii, water department, um, owns, controls, manages, conserves, preserves the water resource in the Keohoe Aquifer. If the water management area is designated to this aquifer, which Mr. Mr. Okumoto has said, doesn't feed into other aquifers. It's a standalone. Um, what they become now is a water applicant. They no longer control what happens in that. They have to come to the to commission like any other applicant for a water permit to drill wells and operate a water system. And so that's a, a great deal of uh, significant risk in terms of whether they'll get it approved or not. There are attendant costs that are involved if they have to show other things besides what they normally have to look at. There are attendant legal costs that may be involved if they get contested and the cases go on for years. Like I was involved in the Waiholi water case, it's been on for many years. The administrative proceedings on the contested case lasted seven months, five days a week. So you're talking about a great deal of cost that potentially could be added to the county of Hawaii as an applicant now to conduct its water obligations to its purveyors, as a purveyor, to the 28,000 residents of this area. So there are significant issues that are relating to water designation for the county. Yeah, a couple of clarifications. One is to Mr. Starr's uh, concern about the well. Uh, normally, that two-thirds of the pump capacity 
is intended to meet the max day requirement, which is one and a half the average day. So in itself, you have a cushion. Um, the other comment I want to make is that, um, you know this thing about future water needs and and um, and how it's going to affect the, the sustainable yield. I think everybody being nice, but the reality of it is, the water department would never let it happen to begin with. It would never happen. So. That's my comment. Can, can I say one more quick thing? I think I, I just remembered something in response to um, Commissioner Beamer's, you know, public trust. Um, I think one, one more thing that I wanted to add was that um, I guess how we how we monitor and we we don't just give out water commitments freely and frivolously is that the only time we really let some applicant come in and and pretty much get a meter over the counter is if it's, you know, for a just a regular house a single family residence. Anything beyond that will require the applicant a, to hire a professional engineer. You know, in other words, somebody who has a, a professional license to come in and tell us what is exactly your water needs, um, draw some plans for us to review, just to, just to keep you um, accountable. Um, and then if we do have enough spare water in the system, we'll say okay. So I think as was previously mentioned by our mayor and probably could be uh, also echoed by some um, private developer types is that, um, again, it, yeah, we don't just give out water commitments or water meters uh, freely or frivolously. We, we make you work for it. Uh, we make you tell us what you're gonna use it for and how much. And we, we don't just say, okay, because a private uh, professional engineer submitted the numbers, it's cool. We, we take a look. Do you really need that much for this type of development? We can even look at similar type uses, you know, like a restaurant, let's say. You really gonna need that much water? Because this one over here only uses this much. So, you know, it's, it's all part of our, you know, and if you think about it, we'd wanna give out more water if we could, right? You know, that's, that's where we generate revenues, but, but that's not how we operate. As my, my understanding is that the role of uh, Board of Water Supply, if, if it's similar at all to the Maui one on which I served for many years, is to uh, uh, provide uh, source and, and transmission so that if anyone wants or needs water, that it's, it's available uh, to the community and not dependent on uh, a, a developer uh, uh, providing it out of the goodness of their heart. Now, it seems from what I'm hearing that uh, Hawaii uh, Board of Water Supply is, well, I thought six million gallons a day in the hole. And now I hear it's seven because you have another commitment for another million gallons uh, that, uh, just the have they just haven't been uh, applied for or or the projects made ready. I don't hear any plan on on the part of uh, BWS to uh, create new source and trans transmission and to uh, have uh, the capital uh, to do that other than hoping that developers will do it and out of the kindness of their heart uh, uh, give the uh, give uh, BWS a crumb so that you can kind of keep on limping along. I do not see uh, that as a department uh, fulfilling uh, the public trust or the department uh, fulfilling what it's created to do. Uh, my question to you is please convince me otherwise, that you have a plan and you have projects and you're actually gonna make wells and transmission lines and make the system whole because you're seven million gallons short right now, uh, sir. Yeah, I guess I have to fully disagree with that because uh, I wouldn't say we're seven million gallons in the hole. The reason why we're pumping basil right now is because we do have high level sources out of commission and inoperable. And we've spent over 
I would say over 40 million in the last 15 years in this one system alone, as far as trying to remediate our challenges, um, as far as uh, shifting the source from basal to high level, as well as to accommodate additional uh, capacity. See, our preference or our desire is to provide water, because not every existing lot of record that fronts our water main currently has a service. We're a big island. We're not as dense as Maui or Oahu. So our preference is to have enough capacity so that somebody who has an existing lot of record can get their first meter. And we'll want that to happen first before somebody drops in you know, a commercial development or a subdivision or whatnot. Um, and that's what we'll have excess capacity for. We also have excess capacity for smaller subdivisions. If you want a five lot subdivision, we have some excess capacity for that in this particular Kona water system. But now if you wanna do 100 lots, now that's different. We don't have that much extra capacity because how we work around here is we don't give preferential treatment to the first guy who comes in line, the first guy with, with the bucks and give all the excess water to that one entity. Basically, we try to split it up so that everybody gets as much equal opportunity as possible. Um, thank you, I wanna go back, help me understand a little bit more about the water use development plans, because uh, that's gonna be a lot of your time, energy commitment, and probably a lot of people here will be very interested in that as it moves forward, and we're looking at, you can hear the questions are like, what tool does that provide for working out some of the areas of disagreement? So, um, and then you, I'm gonna contrast that with what you said about LUPAG, which was, um, you said it's an exercise, it's a tool never meant to be really kind of relied on by the commission feeding into authorized planned use. Is that what I'm hearing you say? So, you know, taking out LUPAG for the moment and really focusing on the water use development plan, how specific will that be or could it be in terms of of projects and really getting into the nitty gritty of all the issues that you're hearing here. I guess what I'm saying is how much of an opportunity is that for you to really drive the bus? Because I hear the county saying we want to stay, you know, in the driver's seat. So what's the potential for that process to do that uh. and, and be quite specific so that um, National Park brought up cumulative impacts? Um, so help me, help us understand that a little more. Yeah, I think, you know, hearing what, what's gone through uh, these past several months and being made more aware, aware of some of these specific concerns, we'll definitely have an opportunity to, um, you know, if it's not in our current scope at this time, to, to put it in there. Um, let's see what else. Uh, and we definitely intend to, at this point, take it to a more detailed approach and maybe even look project by project, um, which wasn't particularly done in that first 2010 update. Um, so that's our intent. Um, again, we'll work with Sea Worm staff to help set up that scope, and I think they're aware of the various concerns and um, questions out there that, that may be of interest to the area. But yeah, we are committed to making this a, a product that's uh, useful for this body because it is part of that state water code. It is our requirement. It is the county's requirement as part of that water code. Um, you know, it, granted, we'll need to work with staff because we don't have all the information, particularly on some private well that are used for various reasons. Um, so we'll work with them on that as we have in the past. Um, we are committed to working with our county planning department and to, this is hopefully gonna be used as a great uh, tool for our county to use um, for planning down the road, whether it be for water, land use policies, things like that. <laughs> 